Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session on ocean-based negative emission technologies. My name is David Keller. Um, I'm a senior scientist at the Guillaumar Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research in Kiel, Germany, where I work in the Marine Biogeochemical Modeling Department. And I work mostly on the topic of negative emission technologies or carbon dioxide removal these days. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of ocean-based negative emission technologies. Uh, let me share my screen here. And so, as I said, I'm going to give you an overview of carbon dioxide removal or negative emission technologies. Um, you'll notice throughout the talk, I may switch back and forth between these terms CDR for carbon dioxide removal and NETS for negative emission technologies. Um, so first, I want to pose the question is, why has carbon dioxide removal been proposed? Why am I talking about this today? Uh, the reason is because climate change. Um, we know that it's a problem. We know that continued CO2 emissions will lead to severe, pervasive, and irreversible impacts upon the Earth system. Uh, this is the reason why we had the Paris Climate Agreement, where most of the countries in the world came together and agreed to try and keep the global mean temperature to well below 2 degrees and hopefully below 1.5 degrees. Um, of course, we know that the problem is greenhouse gas emissions. If we want to try and limit climate change, we have to really stop them or reduce them. So this would be the, the ideal way to do this. However, it's going to be very difficult to reduce emissions. Um, and here I'm showing you a figure from uh, the UNEP emissions gap report. And on the y-axis, this shows um, CO2 emissions in the equivalent of CO2, and then time just out for the next uh, few decades here to the year 2030. Um, and you can see, if you look at some of these trajectories, the ones that bend steeply and go down, these are the pathways that limit warming to two degrees or 1.5 degrees. What countries have pledged to do in Paris, at least these are reoccurring pledges, um, as you will see, there's a gap here, as the name of the report implies. Countries are not meeting or reducing their emissions fast enough to get on these trajectories to limit warming to two degrees or 1.5 degrees. And the current policies of most governments are even above what they've pledged to do for the Paris Agreement. So it's going to be very difficult to reduce emissions. So what do you actually have to do? I, I mean, this sort of shows you know, up to the year 2030 what we'd have to do to reduce emissions to limit warming to two degrees or 1.5 degrees. Uh, if we want to look a little bit on a longer time scale, how would you limit warming to 1.5 degrees? Well, this is a net zero emission scenario, and this shows what has to be done in terms of CO2 emissions, which is again on the y-axis here, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, the world globally would have to come together and reduce emissions at a very, very steep rate. Um, and I, I myself am somewhat doubtful that this can be done. And then you'll notice even here to achieve net zero emissions, which is what would be required to stabilize the climate at 1.5 degrees, you need a little bit of carbon dioxide removal to balance these residual emissions. And these are emissions from sources like air, airlines that are hard to get rid of um, just to redo this. So carbon dioxide removal would be required in this case um, where warming would be limited to 1.5 degrees. But what if we couldn't do this? What if we can't reduce emissions this fast? Maybe we could do it, but a little bit slower. And this would be the case of an overshoot scenario. And this would be where maybe we we start reducing emissions, but we emit a little bit more than we wanted, and maybe it reaches two, two and a half degrees. And then at some point you start pulling out, you use carbon dioxide removal or negative emissions to actually remove some of this extra CO2 that you've emitted that's caused this warming above what your temperature target is. Um, and this is so, why it's called an overshoot scenario. Um, and you need a massive amount of net negative emissions in this case if you're going to try and remove more excess CO2 and hopefully reverse climate change by doing that. Um, the IPCC 1.5 degree special report um, looked into this and they said all pathways that limit warming to 1.5 degrees with limited or no overshoot project the use of carbon dioxide removal on the order of 100 to 1,000 gigatons over the 21st century. So this is why we really need to consider carbon dioxide removal. However, I would like to make the point that reducing emissions must be our number one priority. Carbon dioxide removal or negative emission technologies are not going to solve the problem by themselves, but they are needed in addition, even if we can do the most optimistic reduction in emissions, you still need probably some level of carbon dioxide removal to reach and maintain net zero. Uh, 
Um, so what are these carbon dioxide removal approaches? I've just been talking about them in the abstract. There's a number of ideas that are out there, um, and they can sort of be categorized into natural type of ideas, where you do something like plant a lot of forests, or there's very technological ones. These would be something like building a machine that just captures CO2 directly from the air. And then there's some methods that fall in between. Now, I don't want you to read all these here, um, but what I want to point out is that most of the research that's been done so far into negative emissions or carbon dioxide removal approaches has focused on land-based approaches. Ocean-based approaches have received less attention than land-based ones. Um, so why should we consider the ocean and not just land-based approaches? Well, there's a few good reasons. I um, shouldn't have to tell you them here since I'm at the OCB workshop where most people are ocean scientists. Um, first reason, the ocean covers most of the Earth's surface um, and the biosphere by volume is certainly the largest. So it makes sense if that's most of our Earth to look at doing carbon dioxide removal in this area. The ocean holds most of the carbon in the active carbon cycle. If we look at where all the carbon is, there's a very little bit in the atmosphere here, which is this gray area in this donut um, shaped chart here. Um, and this is where it's causing us a problem by acting as a greenhouse gas. A Little bit more carbon in vegetation and soils, but most of the carbon in the active carbon cycle is dissolved into, is as dissolved in organic carbon in the ocean. So the idea would be, can we move some of this carbon from the atmosphere where it causes us a problem and maybe put a little bit in the ocean, which does have the capacity to store more carbon. Um, Another good reason to consider ocean-based carbon dioxide removal is there's probably less competition for space when compared to land. Um, on land, you, we want cities, we want lots of houses, we want to have land to grow food or pasture land. Um, and if we look at the ocean, um, by comparison compared to our land use, the ocean tends to be a, a rather more empty. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't things going on in the ocean. Of course, we have shipping lanes, we have fisheries going in the ocean, but comparatively, there's more room or space to do CDR in the ocean than on land where you might run into competition for, do we grow a bioenergy crop or do we grow crops to feed people? Um, so there's a number of ideas out there for ocean-based negative emission technologies. And this cartoon here shows a number of those, and I'll briefly walk you through them. Hopefully the talks um, that will come after this one will go more into depth on the cutting edge science into some of these specific approaches. But let me start on the left, at least on my screen here. Um, first, one of the ideas is ocean alkalization. There's a number of ways that one could do this, but the basic idea is that if you can increase the alkalinity of seawater at the surface of the ocean, you can get the ocean to chemically take up more carbon and store it in a form where it, it's not gonna have an acidifying effect. It's also, since it doesn't have an acidifying effect, by alkalizing the ocean, you actually help increase the ocean's buffering capacity and can stop or even reverse ocean acidification. Um, other ideas that have been proposed include fertilization. Um, there's ideas to do iron fertilization, or you could try and do fertilization with nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, where, whichever way you did it, the idea is that you try and stimulate phytoplankton productivity, and hopefully when phytoplankton fix carbon via photosynthesis, um, and when they sink and die, hopefully they'll take some of that carbon um, out of the atmosphere into the ocean and then hopefully store it in the deep ocean. If they're buried, maybe it'll be stored, stored for good, or if they're remineralized at depth, hopefully the carbon will remain in the deep ocean for a long period of time. Um, the next cartoon on here is terrestrial biomass dumping. Um, so some people have proposed, why don't we take crop residues or even trees and try and dump them in the deep ocean or bury them in the ocean sediments um, as a means of lock taking this carbon that's already been locked up in terrestrial biomass and storing it in the ocean. Um, the next idea on here is blue carbon enhancement. So for those of you not familiar with blue carbon, um, this is talking about things like mangroves, salt marshes, seagrass, or macroalgae. Um, these are highly productive systems, and they already store lots of carbon in the case of like seagrass or mangroves. So the idea is first, maybe you can restore what's already been destroyed and maybe enhance these. Maybe you can create artificial seagrass meadows as a means of getting them to, of these ecosystems to sequester more carbon. Um, next in this cartoon are the ideas of artificial upwelling and downwelling. Um, for art, I'll start with first with artificial upwelling. The idea here is that you could upwell nutrient-rich deep ocean water to the surface, which tends to be more depleted in nutrients, and hopefully have a fertilizing effect where, again, you can stimulate phytoplankton and try and enhance the biological pump. 
The idea behind artificial downwelling is that maybe you could pump some carbon from the surface ocean into the deep ocean and hopefully store it that way. Um, the next cartoon on this figure is I have here is marine biomass. Um, this is sort of goes along the lines of blue carbon, but the idea here is you'd grow lots of kelp. You'd have massive kelp farms, and then you could do something when that kelp takes up carbon, you would hopefully do something with that carbon to sequester it. You could sink, simply sink that kelp into the deep ocean and hope it would be sequestered that way, or you could harvest that biomass and maybe turn it into biochar and bury it on land, or maybe you could harvest that biomass and turn it into bioenergy. And then when you combust that, combust that bioenergy, capture that carbon and store it underground or in some other reservoir. And then the final method on here is direct CO2 removal from seawater. Um, it's been shown in the laboratory that you can capture carbon from, CO, um, from seawater. Um, and then once you've captured this carbon, you would of course have to store it somewhere. So these are some of the ideas that are out there for ocean-based negative emission technologies. Now, what do we know about these ideas? Um, so I wanna briefly walk you through a little bit about what we know and don't know about these ideas. Um, this is actually a, a table that I developed for the proposal for a, a project that I have that covers many of these technologies. And this is my own personal opinion here, um, as well as some other experts contribute to this, but hopefully this will give you an idea of sort of the st rough state of the science of this. And I've divided this up into what the approach is, what the physical potential of the approach is, economic feasibility, political and legal constraints, public acceptance, environmental impact, and social impact. Um, so if I start with ocean alkalization, the physical potential of this idea is pretty high. Um, it's been shown in modeling studies that if you increase the alkalinity of surface seawater um, by a massive amount, you can basically counter all the, our anthropogenic emissions and remove all the historical emissions. Of course, that's just the theoretical physical potential. There would be many other constraints, sort of like economic feasibility. Um, this tends to be technology specific, whether you're talking about grinding up alkaline minerals, or maybe you're doing something like electrochemical weathering, they would have different costs to them, um, but they're estimated to be low to medium costs. Um, the political and legal constraints, it's rather unclear as to what these would be for ocean alkalization. Again, it's a bit tech specific. And it also depends on whether you're doing this in the open ocean, that's a global common, or in territorial waters. Um, public acceptance on ocean alkalization. I know there's some current studies going on right now, but really there's not any published literature on this, so it's really unknown how well the public would like this uh, approach. Um, environmental impacts, they're likely to be medium. Um, the impacts on biology are not clear, although there's lots of um, research going on right now to try and quantify what these impacts would be. Um, but I think it's safe to say if you add too much of anything to the ocean at some point, if the alkalinity increased too much, you would probably have an impact on biology. And then the social impacts, maybe these are low um, and less large mining operations are required if you're talking about mining gigaton scales of rock. Uh, the next approach would be direct removal of CO2 from seawater with carbon capture and storage. Um, physical potential is, it's, we really don't know. Um, but theoretically, this could be very high if you had enough store area to store this. Um, the economic feasibility is again unknown. It's probably pretty expensive to do this, but right now we don't really have the information to quantify this. And then all the other constraints are really unknown. We don't know how, how you know the politics behind this, how the public would accept it, the environmental impacts, although I would think if you were filtering lots of seawater, you would probably have some environmental impacts and then what the social impacts would be. Um, if I move on to growing marine biomass or seaweed for biochar, or bioenergy, or to sink, uh, the physical potential, there's been, there's some work going on on this right now, um, but we don't really know. It's probably low to medium if you're talking about gigaton scales. Um, economic feasibility, it's unknown. Could be pretty expensive to do this. It's certainly cheaper to grow crops on land than to grow ma um, macroalgae at a massive scale in the ocean. Political and legal constraints. Um, we already do seaweed farming, so these probably aren't a big constraint. Public acceptance, we don't really know, although biochar by itself has been looked at and that was viewed positively by the public. Environmental impacts, um, again, these are unknown, but if you were had macroalgae farms that covered hundreds of square kilometers, um, you would probably have an impact on the marine environment just through shading or competition for nutrients or disrupting local ecosystems, and then we don't know what the social impacts of this approach would be.
Um, artificial downwelling, um, as far as I know, there haven't been any many studies on this. So we really don't know what the physical potential of this would be. It would probably be very expensive to downwell lots of water. Um, and we don't know what any of the other constraints are for this approach. Um, blue carbon sink enhancement, the uh, studies that have been done so far show that the physical CDR potential, at least at the gigaton scale, is probably low. Maybe a couple of gigatons could be um, locked up by enhancing our, our blue carbon sinks. Um, economic feasibility, it's probably pretty feasible to enhance these sinks. Um, you probably have a pretty low um, legal or political constraints. The public, we don't really know, but I, I suspect the public may be more favorable of natural um, restoring natural systems to do this. Environmental impacts are likely low. Restoring these systems would probably be a good thing, and there's likely many co-benefits. And the social impacts are likely beneficial um, for tourism or things like that, or fishing. Um, next, terrestrial biomass dumping. The physical CDR potential, as far as I know, we don't know what this would be. We don't know what the fate of bio, terrestrial biomass would be if you dumped it into the deep ocean, how much of the carbon would stay there, would it be remineralized? Um, we don't really know how much this would cost. Um, there would probably be pretty high political and legal constraints. I'm, I'm pretty sure it would be illegal to dump lots of terrestrial biomass in many places of the ocean. Public acceptance isn't really well known. Environmental impacts unknown, but you could have theoretically pretty severe impacts if you dumped a lot of terrestrial biomass into certain areas of the ocean. If that biomass was remineralized, you could maybe create anoxic zones on the sea floor. And the social impacts, again, are unknown. Artificial upwelling. Um, the modeling studies that have been done on this has show that it probably has a pretty low physical potential, um, sort of along the lines of ocean fertilization. Um, maybe a few gigatons of carbon could re be removed. Um, we don't really know the economic feasibility it would depend on how you upweld the water, but it would probably likely be pretty ex expensive in, to do this with some technologies. We don't know what the political legal constraints are. Um, I have environmental impacts down here as high. Um, first, because by having a fertilizing effect, you would disrupt natural ecosystems in the ocean. And second, because one of the side effects that's been shown from the modeling studies is that if you deploy these pipes at a massive scale, um, and you're upwelling cold water and then you stop them, you have a termination effect and it would actually get warmer than if you would never uh, use this approach as a climate mitigation approach in the first place. So that could be a, a pretty severe environmental impact. And then social impacts are unknown, but potentially high if you had a big termination shock or you were locked into this. Um, and then the final approach on here is ocean fertilization. Uh, the physical potential here is likely medium to low. Um, economic feasibility, it really depends on what you're doing. It might be cheap to do iron fertilization, but pretty expensive to do massive fertilization with something like phosphorus. Political and legal constraints aren't clear, um, but there is probably some uh, resistance to doing this, ocean fertilization. Public acceptance, it's not really clear. There has been a little bit of work done on this, um, and the public generally didn't like fertilization um, in the past, but I, I don't think it, we can say for certain. Environmental impacts are likely to be high if you're doing ocean fertilization, because you're likely to, by fertilizing the community, you're likely to change the ecosystem uh, structure. And also if you sink lots of biomass into the deep ocean, that could have a large effect. Um, as you'll notice when I was going through this, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, so there's many things that we don't know about ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. Um, we do know that some things have potential, but we also know that there could be some side effects. And then there's just many unknowns that you really have to work out before you can say, these are feasible approaches that, that would might work to remove carbon dioxide. Um, I will say that there's not one approach that will solve all problems. There's So far, the studies have shown there's no silver bullet that you can fix everything with. Um, carbon dioxide removal. Um, is likely going to take a portfolio approach of both land and ocean-based, nature-based and technological approaches to remove carbon at gigaton scales. And a lot of work, is, interdisciplinary work is going to be needed to actually look at how feasible carbon dioxide removal is using ocean-based approaches. Well, there are some disciplinary knowledge gaps that you can, you know, do a, a laboratory study and try and get at some of the ecosystem impacts of some of these approaches. A lot of the work, especially as one moves closer towards feasibility and deployment, is going to require interdisciplinary 
um, work because you really need to know exactly how you're going to deploy it, where you're going to deploy it, what you're allowed to do to really get at what the feasibility is of these approaches. And of course, you're going to have to work with stakeholders. So this actually is transdisciplinary research in that case. Um, just in the last couple of years, um, we've seen that there's been more and more interest in carbon dioxide removal, not just on in the ocean, but on land as well. Um, and governments around the world are starting to realize that, you know, to meet our climate targets, we probably need to seriously look into carbon dioxide removal and figure out what we can do. Um, and then corporations um, are also starting to look into carbon dioxide removal. Some corporations like Microsoft have pledged to remove all of their legacy emissions, and they're looking at how do we do this? Um, so this exam, this is just an example from ocean alkalinity enhancement. Um, and there's a number of research projects going on um, with different universities. Um, there's funding, there's a lot of private and public funding. Um, public funding mostly tends to be in Europe at the moment. Private funding is more in the, in the United States at the moment. And then corporations are starting to look into this, like I said, to see, you know, are there any viable ocean-based options in addition to terrestrial ones that we could potentially do? Um, so it is a quickly growing field that I think will increase in the future. Um, and that's all I have for you today. Uh, so thank you for listening to my introduction here.